Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. As Biden lays out a red line with Israel, and then he says, oh, there are no red lines with Israel, what impact is White House confusion having on the war in Gaza? Let's get to the bottom line. After realizing that he's losing a good chunk of his electoral base, U.S. President Joe Biden and other Democratic Party leaders have turned up the heat on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in words, if not necessarily, in actions. Biden said Netanyahu was hurting Israel more than helping Israel. And a few days later, U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer, who's also been one of the leading supporters of Israel for decades, called the Israeli prime minister an obstacle to peace and actually said he needs to step down. But does this just make Netanyahu more popular in his own country? And how does this public spat do anything to end Israel's war on Gaza, now in its six months of starvation, disease, and total destruction for the millions of Palestinians who've just got nowhere else to go? Today, we're speaking to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and one of the world's leading economists. Dr. Sachs, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Where is the conscience and where are the policies that are focused on the potential of war crimes every day in every way that you see out there, and what should be done about it? Well, what should be done about it is uh, straightforward. Uh, of course, uh, what the government of Israel is doing is unconscionable. Uh, world opinion is uh, united against Israel. Uh, the problem is the United States uh, remains complicit in these war crimes because uh, it's traditional in U.S. politics uh, that politicians uh, show no space uh, between uh, the United States and Israel. Now, what's interesting is uh, uh, we have seen uh, verbally uh, Biden uh, and Schumer uh, have uh, been pretty uh, explicit uh, about uh, the uh, absolute unacceptability of the Israeli government policies, but they haven't acted. What, of course, a strong, effective U.S. president would do would be to stop the flow of munitions uh, if those munitions are being killed, used for slaughter, uh, for killing tens of thousands of innocent people, which is exactly what's happening. Biden is a very weak president. Uh, we don't even know his real mental state, frankly. But he's a terribly weak president, so he wrings his hands. He complains. But it's as if uh, Netanyahu runs the U.S. government, actually. It's, it's something I can't recall uh, in, in this way, where the president says, our policy is so-and-so, and Netanyahu says, no, it's not. Uh, and in fact, Netanyahu uh, is the one that uh, seems to be calling the shots day by day. My question to you is, could he lose the election against Donald Trump over this conflict? I've uh, been telling uh, uh, friends, I don't know if whether they would count me as a friend anymore, but I've been uh, saying to uh, Democratic Party leaders uh, actually for years that the Biden foreign policy, not only vis-a-vis -vis Israel, that's more recent, but also the Ukraine war <coughs> and uh, other tensions, absolutely uh, will hurt them terribly at the polls. I said that in the midterms uh, when uh, the Republicans captured the Congress. I've left the party uh, because I'm so unhappy with the warmongering of the Democratic Party. <laughs> but it's basically uh, warmongering, I think, uh, in support of uh, a president who's a warmonger, but is just generally weak and, and I think, in, incompetent, frankly. So uh, people see this. They don't want Biden even to run for re-election. They think he's too old, too infirm. Uh, and his uh, display of uh, incompetence on these foreign policy issues is, uh, is uh, clearly uh, very much hurting him uh, in uh, these uh, opinion surveys and in his approval ratings, which are awful going into a, a re-election campaign. But to give the president um, an element of, you know, I don't know whether to call it credit, but to kind of note some things they've done, there's clearly a shift in the rhetoric, clearly a shift where, you know, even Chuck Schumer has come out and said, you know, Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu has to go. That You've got a, um, 
a commitment now, although it's taking 60 days or so to build a portal in. I mean, I don't know whether that is, sounds like a good thing or the world is singing, wow, the United States cannot build a port very quickly, but 60 days uh, to get materials in through there. Are there any net positives you see in the shift in tone, the commitment to try to get another aid portal into Gaza uh, than they have now? Well, you know, this port uh, thing is a, a tragic comedy because why are they building a port when uh, they have a road? Uh, they're building a port because uh, the Israeli government is uh, blocking the road. We don't need to build a port to get aid in. We need to stop the absolute uh, war crime policy making of the Israeli government. And that can be done by saying, as the U.S. has on other occasions, no more arms for this kind of policy. We don't want to be complicit in genocide. You know, the genocide charge is in front of the International Court of Justice. Uh, for those of us who watch very closely those proceedings, read the pleadings, and know the 1948 Genocide Code, it's, I think, quite likely that the International Court of Justice is going to find that Israel is in violation of the Genocide Convention. And does the United States want to be complicit in genocide? This is a, a pretty straightforward question. Uh, all of the rhetoric shows the pain, but also the weakness of the U.S. in this. Are we really simply following the line of the Israel lobby? Is that what this is? Or is the president so weak, uh, maybe incapacitated, we don't know, that he's not able to effectively be president of the United States? I don't know. I just watch uh, along with the rest of us, and I don't much uh, like what I see. So, yes, rhetoric is one thing. Uh, Anthony Blinken has been wringing his hands in pain, saying we want the Israelis to do this and that, and then in the same breath, saying no red lines, no red lines. Well, come on, that's complicity in these war crimes. But you're an expert in development, and you've been talking a lot about famine conditions. I want our audience to understand what would be possible if you had a true famine condition, you had true starvation, real starvation, how that scales in terms of the potential casualties of those conditions. Well, first, let me say that we are seeing a massacre in front of our eyes. Uh, it is uh, absolutely inhumane. Uh, it is absolutely war crimes. It is arguably, I personally think, likely genocidal, according to the legal standards of the 1948 Genocide Convention. And so all of this is shocking to me that this does go on day by day in full view. We haven't had the genocides by, uh, captured by uh, video feed day by day. We have IDF forces, the Israeli Defense Forces, standing there thumbs up as they blow up universities, mosques, hospitals, apartment buildings. It's unbelievable. We have members of the Israeli cabinet preaching hate. We've seen these uh, religious, nationalist, extremist rabbis uh, talk about uh, killing all the people in Gaza and ask, do you mean the children? Rabbi says, yes, the children. They can grow up to be terrorists. We're seeing things that are absolutely unconscionable. And we need Israeli leaders and intellectuals to stand up and say that is not acceptable for our country and our society. And it, we're not seeing it, but we need to see that. So this is the, 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 the first point. On the scale, well, there, there's no limit to what's possible because there are hundreds of thousands of people who are profoundly undernourished right now. Food rations have been to a minimum or not rations, uh, actually. Uh, we have seen emaciated children come to the remaining hospitals and dying in the hospitals. We see people swarming the food relief and then being killed. We see people being killed by this inanity of America dropping food packages and killing people 
underneath by the weight of these packages falling to the earth rather than the decency of opening up a supply line for food, fuel, water, which is absolutely a necessity uh, under the conventions of war that Israel plainly violates day by day and the U.S. remains complicit. So it, it, the scale, if, if Israel attacks Rafah, where it has pushed the people of Gaza in an unbelievable concentration of people in the south, uh, saying that's where you're safe, and then starts a, 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 an incursion into Rafah, God knows how many more thousands, tens of thousands, will die if there's no aid relief. Heaven knows what's going to happen on all of this. And so this isn't something that we should be pondering as an intellectual <coughs> or forecasting exercise. It's something that should end today. And it could end today. It could end by the United States government saying, we are not providing the munitions for slaughter, period. That would end it. Israel cannot do this one day without the United States. But all the hand-wringing, all the complaining, all of these supposed uh, statements by Biden that Netanyahu is an asshole, and I'm quoting him, I'm not making that statement, I'm quoting what has been in the papers, that's meaningless if we continue to provide the munitions and we have the statements by Biden and Blinken that there are no red lines for Israel. It's meaningless. So it's, it's really amazing to me. Jeff, it, you, 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 are, know, you I are... travel all over the world. I'm talking to leaders all over the world. People are stunned at this continuing in this way, day by day. They don't understand what's happened to the United States of America. Israel, they, they, they don't like what they see. Right. But the United States of America, they don't understand well, I wanted, what they I, see. Well, I wanted to ask you a question about your interaction with leaders around the world, because I know you interact with them. I've seen you uh, do this. And I'm just saying, as they're looking at the, what you just said, our apparent inability or unwillingness to pressure Israel to open a road gate to get more substantial supplies, medical and health um, uh, and food in, you know, it, what does that say about the conversations about trying to deliver a two-state solution or trying to accomplish anything? I think, are they seeing uh, uh, essentially a United States that's completely impotent in this? Yes. And what are the ramifications for American credibility globally? America is isolated. Uh, it is uh, uh, on the uh, losing end of every vote in the United Nations. We may say, oh, who cares? We're the United States. You know what it's like to be on a vote where the world says Palestine deserves, earns, has the right to political self-determination, and four countries in the world, four, vote against that. Israel, naturally, the United States of America, Micronesia, which by compact is bound to vote with the U.S., so it's not even a choice, and Nauru. Nauru is a very nice uh, island of 12,000 people. That's America's allies. This hurts badly. And so the reputational costs are enormous. But the sense that America's rudderless, uh, leaderless, is very widespread. Let me ask you about the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, UNRWA. Now, three countries, Canada, Sweden, and Australia, have reversed their positions, that they had stopped uh, supporting UNRWA. In, in, there's an investigation going on looking into potentially 14 individuals um, who may have conspired or been part of Hamas when this went on. That's out there. That's public. Um, the United Nations has said it is investigating, and it's been very uh, forward with that. But UNRWA employs t thousands of people, 16,000 in Gaza alone, I'm just interested from your, you know, title, which is sustainable development. Is there any development? Is there any ability to um, economically support and sustain the people of, of Palestine after this if UNRWA does not get support from the United States? There are now, there's now a bill trying to make American suspension of aid permanent, actually, 
And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that front. UNRWA does heroic work in a, a war zone, and it has lost a huge number of staff to this war. Israel targets the United Nations. Uh, Israel uses the United Nations uh, as its punching bag. And UNRWA has uh, taken the brunt of this. Israel makes some statement about UNRWA, and then all of these politicians run to immediately cut off the aid. They see a genocide or massive war crimes going on before their eyes for weeks and weeks and weeks, and they take no action at all. But Israel makes a claim about UNRWA, and within hours, the aid is cut off. It's the word is shambolic, meaning the the shame, the idiocy of these politicians as they scurry around to try to win favor with this lobby and that lobby is disgraceful. That's all it is. This is they they play a game in their politics where it's life and death by the hour that's really at stake. And the attack on UNRWA is despicable action by Israel, which, of course, should know better on that account. But it's a country, after all, that's just killed 31,000 people, most of them women and children. So it doesn't seem to know right from wrong on many other things as well. What are your thoughts, Jeff, on the appointment of someone I imagine you know, Mohammed Mustafa, as the new prime minister of the Palestinian Authority? Palestinian Authority, from my book, is an interesting uh, organization because, in a way, part of its job is to manage the occupation of Palestine, you know, under Israel in, in, a, in a certain way, but also to look for Palestinian interests. But you've got another um, World Bank um, economist who's now in the mix here. What are the um, blind spots of that, or what are the opportunities? Well, the opportunity is the following. Everybody, other than Israel, everybody in the world, including the United States, says we need the two-state solution implemented. This is actually, even the United States says this. Chuck Schumer, President Biden, they say it. OK, let's do it, because this has been talked about for decades. We don't need any more peace process. We don't need any more discussion. We need to implement what is already international law in the form of repeated UN Security Council resolutions and UN General Assembly resolutions. My recommendation to cut through this horror is that the United Nations immediately recognize the state of Palestine as the 194th UN member state with capital in East Jerusalem, with the pre-1967 borders, and that we don't say that that's the end point of some vague peace process, which has been the game and the claim for decades. But that is what is needed for peace now. Interestingly, in September 2011, Palestine, which is a state recognized by 140 countries, but it is not a UN member state, applied to the United Nations for membership. And when that happens, it goes to a membership committee that is constituted by the members of the UN Security Council. And that membership committee looked at the qualifications of Palestine, looked at the claim, and said, yes, this is a valid application. But the United States, of course, blocked it and talked the Palestinians into accepting a UN observer status. That was 13 years ago. They said at the time, by the way, to the Palestinians, it'll come, it'll come, give us time. The United States is not an honest broker in this. The United States has been an agent of Israel. Israel absolutely is blocking the two-state solution that the whole rest of the world wants and that is international law. And so my recommendation is vote the two-state solution. The United States, my recommendation, don't block what you say you want. <laughs> well, and let me, let's move to it. Well, let me ask you about that 
part of, of Palestine, the West Bank, that, that has, you know, I think broadly people see opportunity there. Hamas is not in control, but you have 3,476 new home units that have just been approved in the middle of this crisis, I would say. You have harassment, you have detentions, you have checkpoints, you have ongoing land thefts. Um, you, have, you have that area that so many of these countries have recognized as a state under that sort of control and management um, uh, by Israeli uh, security forces right now. And that's not Hamas running the show as it was in Gaza. What, is, well, I mean, what are we missing in this <coughs> equation, Jeff? Well, what we're missing is that starting in 1970, Israel deliberately and illegally began to occupy, uh, began to settle in the Palestinian territories. And uh, I uh, first saw this and learned of it uh, in 1972, 52 years ago. Uh, this was what at the time was called the Alon Plan. The idea was, well, you know, it may be illegal, but we're going to do it anyway because we, meaning Israel, will make facts on the ground. And they started this illegal settler movement. And it grew, and it's now hundreds of thousands, and it became a major extremist political movement and a religious extremist nationalist movement with representation like uh, uh, Bezalel, uh, Bezalel uh, Smotrich in the cabinet, who's one of the most extremist politicians uh, in Israel's history. And of course, that's the goal. They do not want any Palestinian state. But that's illegal. And to run an apartheid state or an ethnic cleansing or a genocide or whatever they have in their minds, which is, who knows, will never lead to peace. And that's what we're talking about right now. So what are we doing? <laughs> it's clear this is an extremist Israeli government that does not want a Palestinian state. And the whole rest of the world says the only route to peace is a two-state solution. And my view is we can't leave this to Israel-Palestine negotiations. We know what that's going to deliver. We need to put in place the two-state solution. That's a vote that could happen today at the UN Security Council, today. Well, we'll have to leave it there. I really appreciate your candor. Columbia University professor Jeffrey Sachs, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? We're half a year into a war where Israel has killed tens of thousands of innocent people and destroyed the infrastructure of a closed-off area with roughly the population of an American state like Connecticut. Indirect talks between Hamas and Israel are ongoing, but the biggest and most influential player in all of this is the United States, which is simultaneously shipping bombs with no conditions on their use and taking two months to build a port of entry into Gaza to deliver supplies, food and medical that, let's just face it, were desperately needed months ago. Like the presidents before him, Biden sees in one hand the risks of allowing Israel to continue its war, and in the other hand, the political consequences of stopping it, especially in an election year. When will he decide that one outweighs the other? That's when the war will end, and that's the bottom line.